All right. Well, I'll just re repeat myself to some extent here by yeah, let's flash through here, pointing out that um, economists used to defend the idea of using what they call as if assumptions. Uh, and this is quoting from, uh, from Friedman's paper back in the early 1950s, I think, saying that truly important hypotheses have assumptions that are wildly inaccurate. And he then says the more significant the theory, the more unrealistic the assumptions. And the amount of nonsense that's ended up justifying in economics is simply phenomenal. Um, and what he was really doing, when you take a good look at that paper, he was defending the assumptions. He wasn't saying they don't matter. He was basically saying, don't touch our assumptions. And what was actually going on at the same time was there was a whole set of empirical research projects going into what were the actual cost structure of firms. And fundamentally what he was saying is, don't read those papers because they challenge our assumptions. So I want to go through and say, you know, what's happened now because taking that to heart and believing the assumptions don't matter and you can make any assumptions you like, which always means you like neoclassical assumptions, uh, they've ended up with models that failed abjectly. And now what are they saying? Well, here's, again, this is Blanchard once more, rejecting them because they're based on unappealing assumptions. So in some ways this is a weird form of justice coming back to the economics that they're now forced to confront that assumptions do matter. So why do they matter? Well, I think the change is, is because the actual idea that they don't matter is using the idea that we're ignoring stuff that doesn't matter, simplifying assumptions. Okay? And um, what's a simplifying assumption is something like saying if you're modelling how fast a lead ball falls when you drop it out of a leaning tower of Pisa, then you can ignore the fact there's air in the way because the lead's going to fall you know, at the same speed almost regardless of the air. Uh, but it wouldn't be the same case if you dropped that ball out of a jet airplane flying at 35,000 feet or whatever else because ultimately it's going to reach its terminal velocity. So what you're saying is the domain in which you can detect the air, assumption, air resistance is the level at which the um, terminal velocity is irrelevant. But you can also make a heuristic assumption and say, well, build an initial model that ignores air resistance and then add in the air resistance later equations later. And that's the type of approach which structures assumptions in a sensible way. But what Friedman was doing with those, with that argument that they don't matter is, first of all, thinking only about negligibility assumptions, not what Musgrave called domain and heuristic assumptions, but also defending what I've, I think... It's nonsense to call them as if because when you look at the empirical data, they were as-isn't assumptions. And one of the most important as-isn't assumptions is that marginal cost rises. The empirical research that Friedman was recommending people not to read by writing this paper, every last paper found that firms have either constant or falling marginal cost. So how can you build a model based on assumptions that are false? Not just simplifying, simply absolutely wrong. And that's what ended up happening. So I want to take you through the, 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 what actually happened in the empirical, numerical research and empirical research and why it makes sense. It contradicts the a priori logic that economics uh, tend, to, tend to use all the time. So you're looking back on this paper, again, written back in 1953. That's the second significant paper written in the year that I was born that I wish was never written. Uh, and uh, you said you, you, the idea of a completely realistic theory is a, in part a straw man. Uh, it's impossible to work out. In another theory, he says, it is utterly impractical under present conditions for the manager of a firm to attempt to work out marginal costs and equate them, etc., etc. And he says, once you do that, you reject the whole theory. But what he didn't want people to read were these papers because they're all saying, we find marginal cost does not rise. And that puts an complete hole in the entire argument that neoclassical economics makes about the structure of of firms. There's at least 100 studies that have been done uh, since starting probably back in the 1920s or 1930s. So it began with what's called the Oxford Study Group, which was a, a group of Oxford English economists who decided they should actually uh, meet with businessmen on a regular basis and learn from businessmen and businessmen could learn from them. And their very first meetings, the businessmen were just shaking their heads with the notions the economists are coming out about rising costs as volume went up and saying, we don't, that doesn't happen to us. What firms have you found that in? Well, none, but it's obvious that it happens. No, it doesn't. 
So they then started doing research and, and going and checking, seeing what firms' cost functions actually were, and they all found that between 89 and 95 percent of firms, when you showed them what was seen as a representation of costs, said our marginal costs fall with output; they don't rise. Now, why is the theory of it rising? Well, it comes back to the idea that there's and the whole, remember, we, we derive the idea, or neoclassical economics derives the idea of a rising sh- short-run supply curve under assumptions of some one factor of production that's fixed, which is normally capital, of course, uh, and you can only increase output by using more of a variable factor, which is normally labour. And you're hiring workers in a perfect competitive labour market, so you have no argument about rising costs of buying the workers. You pay the same wage no matter how many workers you hire. It's the usual so-called perfect competition model. And you also assume the workers of uniform ability. So people, when you explain this model to them, what they're thinking is you've got to pay more to get more workers, and you're going to hire very productive workers to begin with and less productive workers later, which is quite potentially realistic. And those are reasons why you might actually find, therefore, a cost more to produce. But people get lulled into accepting, with with that real-world rationalisation that makes a bit of sense, they end up accepting a model which is nonsense. And I want to show why it's nonsense. So if you actually have those assumptions where the wage does not rise as you hire more workers, and the workers of uniform ability, so there's no decline in their productivity as you hire more, then your productivity per worker is simply a function of the ratio of that variable factor of labour to the fixed factor of capital. And what's being argued is that there's some ideal ratio. Okay? And if you start with less labour a lower labour to capital ratio, then you're going to get lower output. You'll get rising marginal output and therefore falling marginal cost for a while as you approach the perfect ratio. But when you go past it, you start getting declining output then, and that's the explanation for the rising supply curve. So this is the sort of stuff that effectively the inverse of the marginal product curve times the wage is the marginal cost, and that's rising, not because the wage is rising, not because the productivity of the workers is falling, but because the individual workers, but the ratio, you're going past the point of efficient production. So pardon me sending this up a bit, but what I, what I do is say, well, let's actually look at that uh, in terms of workers and jackhammers. That's the ideal ratio, one worker per jackhammer. So what the theory is saying is you have a fixed number of jackhammers. Let's say there are six initially. I've got six or seven there. Six, OK. And you dig a hole, you've got to hire workers. So the first worker you hire operates all six jackhammers at once. That's nonsense, OK? But that's what we're actually effectively imagining with, this, with, the, with the theory. Okay? Uh, and then when you have a second worker, then each worker work operates with three jackhammers, yada, yada, yada. You finally get to the stage where you've got six workers each with a, with a jackhammer, and that's your perfect ratio. But then when you want to dig more holes in that, you've got to have more than one worker per jackhammer, yeah? which is just... It's silly. Okay, it doesn't deserve respect as a concept. It's not how firms operate at all. And and when you read some of the correspondence that some of the businessmen wrote back to economists when they had the theory explained to them, said, "You must actually be assuming we're morons." You know, but this is what the economists were saying was actually intelligent. So it, it is just crazy that this actually happens. But this is what we've taught our students. Um, it. What tends to happen, and I'll get onto this into a moment, is that you use, you work at the ideal capital labour ratio for every every worker you have. You have idle capital. You don't use it until you need to. You need to use it, so you don't get the whole idea of diminishing marginal productivity in the very first instance. But all this stuff is what the students get taught, and it's persuasive. But it then becomes a mindset, and we need to break away from the mindset. Now, when you look back at Schraffer, Schraffer's first contribution was back in the 1920s in, in English, when his backers turned up in England, and he said that if you're going to say there's diminishing marginal productivity, then you've got this assumption of one fixed input and one variable input, and that gives you a rising supply curve. Now, to get to do the supply and demand analysis, the supply curve and the demand curve have to be independent. If there's a different supply curve for every demand curve, then you simply can't do the analysis to begin with. Well, he said, let's just take a close look at this. What's the, what do you mean by a fixed factor? He said, if you have a broad definition of industry, say capital or agriculture or, or is your definition of an industry, 
then if you're going to use one factor more intensively, like land, for example, you're going to drive up its price. You're going to have an impact on the distribution of income. And if you impact the distribution of income, you'll change the demand level as well. So you don't get independent supply and demand analysis if you make a broad enough definition that you can actually talk about intensive use of a factor that way. But on the other hand, if you don't define it narrowly, as I've done with that example a moment ago of jackhammers to be used to, to build roads, then you can't say the capital is fixed because there'll be unused capital you leave idle. Um, so if you have one worker and there's six jackhammers, so you'll have one worker per jackhammer and the other five aren't used. And then two workers or two jackhammers, etc., etc. And if you get to the stage where you need more than seven jackhammers, uh, because you've got seven workers, you hire the jackhammers from somewhere else. And there's very little impact upon the price in other industries. Uh, and the trivial impact upon the demand for jackhammers as well. So you're using, you're using the, the, your, your variable input, so-called, and your fixed input, so-called, at a constant ratio all the way through, so you won't get diminishing marginal productivity. <coughs> now that was, therefore, the, the road construction cost will be a linear function of the labour input, equally a linear function of the, of the capital you're actually using. It's going to be a linear relationship, not the non-linear stuff that the neoclassical theory goes on about. So marginal product will be constant and therefore your cost will be constant. So Straffer's logical argument was either if you work with a broad definition of industries and factors, then you get you do get the, the variable ratio possible coming out of that, but you no longer get independent supply and demand curves. So for each demand curve, there's a different su supply curve. You simply can't do this sort of analysis. Um, or if you work with a narrow definition, which makes more sense, what an industry is and what a, what a variable factor is and a fixed factor, then you're going to have labour input with a constant labour to land ratio, for example, in producing wheat. You can get a constant increase in output for the adding more of your so-called variable factor inside. There's the marginal product's going to be constant, and so your, your uh, marginal cost is going to be constant. Your average cost will therefore fall because you're using, you've got to, um, the, the more of the very, you, you, you've got to have a certain amount of land to do this. It's in the case of combining labour and, and, and fertiliser on that land, you, you're going to get a declining cost because your fixed costs are going to be spread over a larger amount of output. So that's the type of cost structure that Schraffer said logically will apply in when you actually work at the level of actual firms. Now, when you look at the empirical critiques, these are some of the, the papers. So uh, Fred Lee, who died recently, a uh, leading post-Keynesian who specialised in microeconomics, he did a brilliant survey of all this called post-Keynesian pricing theory. And these are just some of the names of researchers that have been involved in this. The ones that Friedman was saying don't read were largely Eitman and Guthrie. Uh, and the, what I find intriguing is because neoclassicals don't read this empirical literature, they keep on rediscovering it by accident. And the last time it accidentally happened was Alan Blind, of course, as you know, the leading neoclassical economist. He, um, being a, a, a new Keynesian, he wanted to get explanations for why prices were sticky. And he designed a quite a brilliant research project, very well funded, lots of PhD students sent out to ask the questions. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't to send out the surveys and wait for the mail to come back. It was going out and physically talking to people, so very, very well-funded research. He worked out that his students actually interviewed corporations which were responsible for 15% of America's GDP. That wasn't an insignificant sample either. And what he found in Chapter 4 of this book was that, that the firms, in this case, in his case, 85% of firms, 89%, said their marginal revenue and cost concept was just irrelevant, didn't matter to them. Every extra sale added to profit and the one little thing which I, I throw this to my students as a way of breaking through the, the mindset of the, the neoclassical vision, that if the neoclassical theory was right, then there would be an ideal level of output for every firm. And if you sold more than that amount of goods, you would lose money. So a sales manager's most important task would be to tell the staff when to stop selling. That would mean on a regular basis a sales manager would be ringing up and saying, stop selling, we've reached the point where marginal cost exceeds marginal revenue. Now, no sales manager has ever made that phone call, and any sales manager who did that would be sacked. Okay? 
it is just nonsense. But we've let ourselves believe this stuff. So average costs actually fall with output. Um, you have a high fixed cost, very high fixed costs are the, the norm f- for most firms. Constant or falling variable costs, and therefore the higher the volume you sell, the more profit you make. And what you're trying to do is take volume away from your competitors, and it becomes an effective demand issue rather than the neoclassical micro demand. And firms are operating well within capacity. They don't operate at the margin. Any firm operating at the margin has built a factory that's too small. Again, if you put out sales in the context of a growing economy, if you have an economy where you expect growth to be sort of of the order of 3% in real terms per annum, if you build a factory which on day one is working at 100% capacity, you've got to build another factory on day two. So what you do instead is you build a factory which on day one operates at 50% capacity and you design it so that it reaches maximum efficiency when it hits 100%. And therefore, you are going to have falling costs until you get out to that point and tons of spare capacity, and it makes eminent sense to do it. Now, there's lots of studies. My favourite is one from Eitman and Guthrie in 1952, and as you can see, it's the year before Friedman wrote his methodology paper. This is the one he's saying don't read. And they showed managers eight hypothetical average cost curves looking like this. Which one do you reckon is the neoclassical one? Of that lot. What looks like the textbook drawing? Which one? Pardon? Number three. Okay, that's the textbook drawing, isn't it? Okay. Well, they also get a verbal description of the as well, and they said, um, like, of the of the lot, three, four, and five are the only ones you can say look neoclassical. Three is clearly like something you'd find in Man Q. Four less so, because look where the minimum cost point is further out, and five much less so. No way six, seven, or eight qualify. There's a textbook drawing. And they explained what each one of these were verbally. Notice seven. High at minimum output, decline gradually to capacity at which point they are lowest. Okay. So it's quite clearly explained both in the drawing and, and verbally as to what they wanted managers to say, you know, which one looks most like your cost structure. And what they got back was this set of answers. Notice how many companies said the textbook model sits one out of 334. Okay. Only 18, if you add up those three, four, and five that are vaguely like the neoclassical, only those 18, and that's where the 95% idea comes from, look vaguely like what the textbook draws. And most of them said number seven, lowest costs at maximum output. The opposite of what we teach students in straight micro. So you don't even get to first base in this case. If you, ha- if you don't have rising marginal cost, then you can't talk about equating marginal revenue and marginal cost as a way of working at a profit maximising level. Okay? So it's even with the formula that I'm going to show you shortly, which is the correct formula, um, it, it makes no sense. Because if this is the case that marginal cost is constant or falling, then average costs are going to be higher and if you're setting a price equal to marginal cost, you're losing money. Even setting marginal revenue to marginal cost is likely to be cost, losing cost. And here's the, the, um, the argument that came from most of the firms that Eitman and Guthrie spoke to, is to say that factories are designed by engineers who are designing them so that the variable factor, which is labour, is going to be used most efficiently when the plant is close to capacity. And consequently, average variable cost declines until you reach that maximum capacity. You've also got uh, fixed costs declining per unit of output at the same time. So it makes it physically impossible to work out how much to produce by equating those two. And that's what Friedman was really targeting. This is like from 1947. He was involved in this research project for quite some time. But Eitman was trying to get us to be realistic about what firms are like and build a bottle based on that realism. And Friedman was saying, ignore it. Well, look where it got us. Now, this is all very well known in the post-Keynesian community, of course. It's one reason why a lot of post-Keynesians became post-Keynesians, where they realised how unrealistic the micro was. But Blinder, as so often happens, goes and rediscovers it. This is the summary table of all the various features he found from his survey done by his PhD students of 
of, you know, I think about 500 companies which were responsible for about 15% of America's GDP. I've just highlighted a few of them that matter here. Down here, that's the percentage of firms which marginal costs are increasing, 11%. And that's, by the way, the highest ratio anybody's found in a survey. Uh, constant was 48%, decreasing 41%. And this, the concepts were explained to the managers by students with PH, doing PhDs in economics. It wasn't, you couldn't say that they didn't have it clearly explained to them, clearly understood. Importantly, only one fifth of sales were to final consumers. Most sales are to other businesses. And this comes back to the input output structure of production. Most production is needed as inputs to other forms of output. So you don't have the whole idea of demand curves and, and so on applying for most of the exchanges that occur. The actual part going to consumers is a small proportion of total sales. So what we've got is a theory of the firm based on as-isn't assumptions. Okay. No wonder it, when you try to build a macro theory based on that micro, you're going to be modelling a world that doesn't exist. Now, to me, the really interesting one is the theory of the consumer. And this is the idea that consumers are rational utility maximizers, where Samuelson gave us the definition of rationality and the axioms of revealed preference. The idea of completeness, so given any two bundles, you can decide which one you prefer, whether you're indifferent. Transitivity, uh, I, I prefer to B and B to C than A to C. Non satiation, so more is better. And convexity, so marginal utility positive but falling as you consume more. That's supposed to be a rational consumer. And that then lets you use indifference curves to represent a consumer's taste. So uh, the whole idea is that each point, as you know, I'm done telling you, you all know what this means, A and B are on the same indifference curve. Uh, Z's higher, so you prefer any Z to any Y. Uh, more is always better, so any, any Q is better than any P, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Samuelson had objections come back to him from this, because it was his, his invention, this way of representing tastes. And he said, well, they're unobservable. And he said, oh, no, they're not. Um, what you can do is infer them from people's behaviour. This is where revealed preference came from. So more is preferred to less. So what that means is, if you look at that simple combination, if you offer a consumer a choice of A or anything in the box above A, then the consumer has to prefer anything in the box to A. Uh, or if you have a situation like this, then if a consumer is given a choice between A, B and C and prefers C, then C must be on a higher indifference curve. So you can actually use this and draw the diagram that way. That was, that was Samuelson's argument. So that's the way of you know, deriving indifference curves from the actual data. Well, the fun thing is some... I, I must actually meet this man one day. I'd love to, love to meet the academic who did this, a German academic called Sippel. And he actually decided, I think, to test this really as a way of making the economics more realistic to his students. And because what he actually did was he tested with a group of 12 students in quite a detailed test. And then he did exactly the same thing again with a group of 30. That, that to me implies he tried one class and got the totally contradictory results. And thought he better expand the sample and did a larger class and got totally contradictory results. It wasn't a case of your sample size. So he gave them, the students, a budget constraint and a set of eight commodities that they could purchase. And it was things like video clips, watch a video clip for 30 to 60 minutes, play a computer game, read a magazine, drink Coke, orange juice, coffee, candy, and pretzels. So those were the goods. And the students were paid to consume. Okay? And he gave them a set of choices and, um, and they had to work out you know, what, what maximised their utility each time, and they did the test ten times with different relative prices and budget constraints. And then at the end of it, as well as being paid to do the experiment, they'd get to consume one of the ten bundles. Okay. So they actually were really saying, "Oh, this is what I, that's the one I'd prefer to get." You know, they really were making serious decisions about it. And he said they had obviously they were making as close as possible to a choice that max that was what they wanted to do given the amount of money they had. They spent thirty to forty minutes corrected entries, getting it all right, you know, all very careful stuff. And what he was testing was things like the weak, weak axiom, that if you prefer A to B, then you'll never prefer B to A. Um, or the strong axiom, that if you prefer A to B and B to C, then you'll, you'll never prefer C to A. And the generalised axiom about the, the loss in utility involved in making a, 
a choice that's not as optimal as you could have made, uh, given the cost of doing it. Now, with all that stuff, let's actually put some numbers on this. Let's imagine you've got this sort of budget line here. That sort of situation applies. Then if you choose A over B, then the theory says A must lie on a higher indifference curve. So a rational consumers should always prefer A to B. Now, what actually happened was they didn't. Sometimes they chose B, A over B, sometimes B over A. Okay, with price combination that made both of them affordable. So why? Well, this look at the look at the results. This is the um, the results of the tests. All these various violations occurred, and SIPL went through all sorts of mechanisms to try to work out whether you could revise the theory to make it consistent with the results. But they ended up completely failing. In fact, one thing he did was say, well, let's imagine the difference curves aren't very fine. Let's imagine they're very thick. Once he did that, he made the theory consistent with the results, but he also found that throwing a dart at a, a dartboard was rational. In fact, more rational than the choices the students were making. So random choice became rational with the thicker indifference curve. So nothing actually fixed anything up at all. And he finally, uh, a very uh, well-stated set of conclusions, the evidence is at best mixed. There are some who appear to be optimising, but the majority are not. And we call the universality the maximising principle into question. So it's quite a, quite a strong negative conclusion. But it raises the question, what are people actually doing? Now, if they're not maximising utility, what are they doing? You can call them irrational for the choices they make. And my argument is simply no. It's the definition that neoclassicals have that's irrational. And that really comes down to the idea that if you, can, you have a complete set of preferences because it's simply impossible to have those preferences given how many uh, combinations are available. Now, if you consider any two bundles, completeness says you can decide whether you prefer bundle A to bundle B. And when you draw it the way we draw it in textbooks, that looks quite easy because you've just got two items and each combination is easily identified and there aren't very many. There's, if you had, imagine there were ten, you know, allow one between one and ten of each. You actually draw some numbers on these silly diagrams now. Uh, there's your ideal maximising utility position. But imagine you draw, you know, between one and ten biscuits and one and ten bananas. You've got a hundred combinations, and you can ignore some because they're simply out of reach of your budget. Others are close enough that you've got to consider them. And with 10 pairs to look at and 10 budget sums, it's pretty easy to work out you know, which one maximises your utility. That's quite simple. But what about a third item? What if you want to add satays in there as well? You know? Well, how do you represent it? You've got to add an additional axis. And each time you do it, you go from 10 to 100 to 1,000 to 10,000, etc., etc. You get an exponential problem coming out of this. Four commodities to 10,000. Now, Kip Sibyl had eight commodities, so there's eight dimensions to the data set his students are being asked to consider. And he gave them a smooth choice. They could make any amount they like, but just imagine there were only five combinations possible, like, you know, 0, 15, 30, 45, and 60 minutes of watching a video, rather than arbitrary minutes. That gives you five to the eight combinations now, that is a total of 390,000 different combinations. Now, what's the possibility for you being able to work out which of those 390,000 shopping trolleys, effectively, contains the bundle that maximises your utility? It's just ridiculous. Yet, that's the, what we're glossing over. You simply can't differentiate that finally. So, it's an as-isn't assumption. There's no possibility for us to be computationally able to work out in that detail, the, the axiom of completeness. And it's not a simplifying assumption, it's counterfactual. So what we actually do, when you think about it, we use habit. Okay? We work out something we, we like, we tend to buy that all the time. You have to be really pushed very hard to move away from that habitual bundle. bundle. So we're not at all describing how actual people behave. Again, it's another as isn't assumption. But even if we're right, and this is, I think, one of the most important results in economics, and it's now really, I think, the major reason why DSG models are falling apart, 
Uh, when you do the whole idea of developing a demand curve from this idea of indifference curves, then you get the idea that the individual faces a downward sloping Hicksian compensated demand curve. But when you look at the market level, if you add those up, you get any polynomial shape whatsoever. And what that is, is, in my opinion, a proof by contradiction. This is how Sonish and Sander uh, and, and, and co, uh, they don't explain it this way. This is my way of trying to represent what's actually going on. What they're saying is if you have two consumers and you add up their demands, when they've got perfectly downward sloping demand curves themselves, derived from this neoclassic concept, that's the market demand curve you can get. And what it is is actually what I call an accidental proof by contradiction. Uh, one of my uh, physicist friends did a proof by contradiction of one of the propositions in my, my uh, Minsky model, ended up being five pages long. Okay. Proof by contradiction is a lot more complicated than any of us have done in learning mathematics as, as students at university. But what they did was they assumed market demand curves do obey the law of demand, fundamentally. They derived conditions under which this was true, and they contradicted the initial assumptions, which proves the market demand curves don't obey the law of demand. That's fundamentally what happened. Well, let's look at it. You derive a, the, the individual demand curve by taking a consumer with a well-behaved utility function and varying one price while keeping the others constant and the income of that consumer. So you have a pivot point that doesn't change. And for using that, giving different price ratios for bananas to coconuts, uh, I'm doing my Man Friday and, and Robinson Crusoe analysis here, then you drive a downward sloping demand curve for the individual that way. So you're assuming you can vary price without varying income, and you're assuming, therefore, that this pivot point doesn't change when you move change the price of bananas. And you also assume that you can do the hixing and compensation. Okay? You can have a, a higher... You can, you can work out how to get the consumer on an individual demand curve to hixing and compensate for the income effects of changing the prices. And therefore, you get the necessity, no matter what good you're talking about, you get this downward sloping mark, uh, individual demand curve. So the SMD conditions are working out, does that survive aggregation? And the answer they got was no. So, and that's because they're ignoring the impact of price changes on income distribution, when an essential part of the theory is that prices are part of the determinant of incomes. So if you have, let's see what's going on in terms of a, I'm putting this in terms of a, a proof by contradiction. If you're going to have a two or more consumer model, then each consumer has to have different sources of incomes and different tastes. Otherwise, there's only one consumer. Okay? And secondly, tastes have to change with income. Otherwise, there's only one commodity. If you bought everything in the same ratio, independent of your income, you're talking about buying one thing. Spam this and spam that. So let's consider we've got a two-consumer, two-commodity world. So you've got Crusoe and Friday, your two consumers, and coconuts and bananas are your two commodities. Crusoe owns the bananas, so he makes the income out of the bananas. Friday makes the money out of the coconuts. Coconuts are a necessity, so you consume less of those as your income rises. Bananas are a luxury. And Friday happens to have a higher preference for coconuts than Crusoe does. To put that together... And then you start with an arbitrary price ratio. There's Crusoe's uh, indifference because I haven't uh, bothered drawing in Friday. It's just to save drawing time. So you've got the same price ratio, of course, in this case. Keep aggregate income constant. And you have, let's consider a lower price for bananas. So you now have a flatter line coming out there. Now what's going to happen? Well, Crusoe sells bananas. So his income is going to fall. Therefore, comparatively, Friday's is going to rise. So you've now had a change in the distribution of income. When you work out the demand, you might find that the demand for bananas falls because of the lower price rather than rising because Crusoe, who's the banana owner, his income has fallen. Friday's income has risen, but Friday prefers coconuts to bananas. Then what about if you try to do the Hicksian compensation, keep relative prices constant and increase income equally? So what you're doing in that case is you're moving the, uh, the uh, budget line out for both of them. But at the same time, 
because bananas are a luxury, the curve for the banana is going to move out more than the curve for the coconuts. So Crusoe's income is going to rise more than Friday's. And consequently, you can't compensate for the income effect because the uniform increase in income will change the distribution of income. So for all these reasons, when you try to derive a market demand curve without taking into account the difference in income between the two agents, you find you get a, a demand curve that can have any shape you can draw using a polynomial. Now, how do you avoid that? And this is what you'll find in those papers. You assume they're identical tastes, which means there's only one consumer. But even worse, you assume there's only one good. Now, how can you have a market demand curve if there's only one good? How can you have prices if there's only one good? But that's what's involved in trying to aggregate at this level. So you've started with one, two consumers with different tastes and two different commodities. You've ended up with one commodity and one consumer. You've proved that the demand curve can have any shape at all. <coughs> so that's what they draw. <coughs> that's what's justified by the theory. <coughs> now, of course, that's not to say the curves have that shape. I was, I was once um, in a discussion with Deirdre... Um, uh, what's Deirdre's last name? Deirdre Milkowski at a conference in New York. And I made a comment about this, and she said, but yes, Steve, surely you're not saying you think demand curves uh, rise with price. And um, unfortunately, I was too flabbergasted by the answer to actually make the sensible reply, saying, no, Deirdre, I'm not saying that, but I'm simply saying you haven't got an explanation of why it falls. And that's what matters. This is an essential part of the theory, and neoclassical economists can't explain why it happens, because they leave out the distribution of income. But that was part of the classical theory. So in many ways, what I see neoclassical economics being is a 140-year research project to prove that the classicals were right in the first place. You've got to look at social classes. You've got to look at income distribution. That's what they haven't done. Now, the supply curve is, is just as bad. I've already said that it's, you know, it's, it's nonsense anyway. It doesn't apply because we haven't got rising marginal cost. But why is the theory obsessed with perfect competition and the idea of rising marginal cost. Well, if you don't have so-called perfect competition, then you don't have a supply curve either. Now, I know most of you should know this, but a lot of economists don't realise it. Unless you have a horizontal demand curve for the individual firm, you do not get that the firm supplies on the marginal cost curve, and therefore you can't derive a supply curve. So that's why they obsess about it so much. That's why it's so central to the theory. But the actual mathematics behind it is a fallacy as well. Even if you let them get away with the as-isn't assumption that marginal cost rises. Uh, this is quoting Mankiw. I've had so many abusive email correspondence with neoclassical economists over this because they happily confuse the Marshallian model that I'm saying is mathematically wrong with the corner model that's mathematically correct but wrong in other ways. And they happily mix the two to attack me for making any contradiction in the theory at all. I've been accused of lying to one of my research partners by one of the rather... I, I won't get started on what I think about the guy. Uh, neoclassicals, I was corresponding over this. But so he said, you're lying about what the textbooks say. This is me quoting Mankiw here. This is Mankiw defining perfect competition, saying, we assume the market's perfect competitive and they have two primary characteristics, a homogeneity of goods, which itself is nonsense, Mobile phones aren't all the same. Okay, Homogeneity is not the nature of real competition anyway. But secondly, buyers and sellers are so numerous that no single buyer or seller can influence the market price. So it's simply saying the sheer number of buyers and sellers is why there's no influence on price. Okay, And therefore there's supposed to be price takers. That is mathematically false, and I want to show why it is mathematically false. And Joe Stigler beat me to it. I, when I first uh, found this result... I didn't know of Stickler's paper under one of my research colleagues at my university, Raja Janaka, pointed it out to me that way back in 1957, Stickler had shown that it was false as well. And this is in the Journal of Political Economy, which you know is you know, one of the leading conventional journals. He had this little expression in the footnote saying, let's one so, so sell QI, the other selling Q, 
the seller's marginal revenue, there's the rate of change of you know, total revenue with respect to their own output, is price times their quantity. And now he's to just use the, the chain rule to break the slope of the individual market demand, individual demand curve into the market demand curve times how much market output changes with the change in output by a single firm, said, well, that's equal to one. Under this theory where firms are the non corno theory, with the Marshallian idea that they are atomistic, which they used to describe in textbooks when the older members of the audience here, including me, studied this stuff. Um, they, don't, they don't use that phrase anymore, and I think it's partly why they don't realise the, how they're getting the wool pulled over their eyes. So the slope, because the slope of the market demand curve is taken as being negative, the only way that you can get uh, this being zero, so that marginal revenue equals price, is if the rate change in output for the industry relative to a change in output by a single firm is zero. But on Marshallian assumptions, it's one. And what, that's exactly what Stigler is stating here. And it's easy to show it if you do an expansion in partial differential terms of the, of the change. So if you say that change in output for a single firm, a ch change in market output given a change in output by a single firm, is the sum of the change in output by one firm given a change in output by the other. So this is summing across J firms what happens to output for each of the other firms when one firm changes its output. Well, it's change in output, the first firm given a change in output by firm I, plus change in output for the second firm given a change in output by firm I, finally plus change in output by QI given a change in QI, and all the way out, you've got a whole lot of zeros in one one. That's the basic logic. So what Stigler showed was the demand curve for a so-called petty competitive firm can't be horizontal, it has to have the same slope as the market demand curve. Now when you substitute that into your so-called profit maximising formula, you find you don't maximise profits that way because the single formula says maximise profits with respect to your output. Okay? That's a partial differential, fundamentally. What you've got to look at is maximising your profit given total industry output, even though you can't control it. So it's the total differential that matters. So the total differential of your profit, how much does your profit change given a change in market output, becomes this expression where we, we can already show this is equal to one. This is the inverse of what I've shown you beforehand. So you then get an expression here saying the change in the profit for the I firm is the sum of the change of its profit given change, uh, change in its profit given change in output by the other Q firms in the industry. So you're summing over, over J firms and you have this expression which you have to sum over J times, uh, N times. Now this first expression here, the price of output given a change in output, the impact of a change in output of firm J on the output of QI, N minus one times that's going to be zero. One time it's going to be one, so you get one element for the price, market price. Here, you've already shown you can substitute the market demand curve for this expression, so you can get an N times QI. And this here is going to be zero N times because it's the change in the costs of firm I given a change in output of firm Q. Now, N minus one times it's going to be zero, once it's going to be the marginal cost of the jth firm. So you finally do all that, and you find this is where you profit maximise. Okay. It's where it's price plus n times the output of the i firms times the price times the market demand curve equals the marginal cost of the i firm. And what the neoclassical formula has done is just leave out the n, okay. which is a pretty big mistake when n is close to infinity, according to the theory. So the true formula. If, the marginal, if market demand curve slows down, which they can't prove, and if marginal cost rises, which it doesn't. Okay. So it's, it's a total nonsense, but I want to show that even the nonsense is mathematically wrong. You maximise profits if, if the I firm sets this formula. Okay. Now I can take this and shuffle around and say QI times DP to Q is therefore equal to minus price minus marginal cost divided by M. That's part of the logic here. So I now, if, if I just take 
one of these uh, QI times DP to Q out, what I get here is marginal revenue for the i firm plus n minus 1 copies of QI times DP to Q, which is over here. So I then substitute that in and it takes marginal cost over the other side. So I've now got marginal revenue minus marginal cost. So this is the genuine profit maximising formula if marginal cost rises. Minus n minus 1 times QI DP to Q. Well, that's that bit there, which I can now substitute with this. So I do that substitution, and what I get is this formula, and I shuffle it around, and that's the correct profit maximising formula. You don't equate marginal revenue and marginal cost, you make the gap between them equal to n minus 1 over n times price minus marginal cost. Now notice when that is n is equal to 1, that's the monopoly formula. So only in the case of monopoly is the so-called profit maximising formula actually correct. Beyond that, it doesn't maximise profits. So the whole analysis we have that we teach students about micro is just wrong. Wrong empirically, wrong logically. Okay. And I give full, well, you give full data in this paper. Standish, by the way, is the author, is the a guy who writes Minsky. Okay. He's the computer programmer with a PhD in, in physics. So the micro theory it makes first it makes factually false assumptions about firms' costs. It's got a computationally impossible model of consumer behaviour. It can't explain demand curves, even though they're essential to the theory, and it gives false advice about profit maximization, even if the model was correct, which it isn't. And that's what they call good micro foundations, which they're trying to do macroeconomics. So it's no wonder we're in the mess we're in. Now, if you actually had good micro foundations, what you'd try to do is provide a parsimonious description of actual competition and actual demand. In that case, you'd be talking about heterogeneous products. Okay, it's not Samsung, it's not phones, we don't buy phones, we buy Samsungs or Apples. Or Androids, or God knows what else, okay. And the, those firms compete by product differentiation. So Samsung sells extra phones by blowing up aeroplanes. Okay. Sometimes it goes wrong. Um, and consumer tastes evolve with those products over time. Imagine trying to sell a 10-year-old phone today. Okay. Imagine taking a phone today back 10 years in time. Okay. Uh, there's, this evolutionary competition is what actually goes on in real markets. And if we wanted to have a genuine micro foundation in which to build a macro, that's what we should be trying to do. Okay. And that's what a lot of people doing multi-agent modelling are trying to do in various ways now. <clears throat> and then demand is not limited by rising costs. It's limited by how much money consumers are willing to spend on that market and how much of that you can secure. It's an effective demand constraint, not a micro cost constraint. And the rule also, and this is I highly recommend reading the work of Janos Kornai, one of the great neglected intellects in economics. Kornai uh, wrote a set of brilliant papers called Demand Constrained versus Resource Constrained Economies. He was a Hungarian, he is, pardon me, Jonas is still alive and kicking. Ages, I mean, almost 20 years ago, to my great embarrassment, somebody, I was discussing on a discussion group, early internet discussion group on Marx, and somebody asked about Kornai, and I made a comment, I think, he, I think, he's, I think he's dead actually. And I got an email to say, reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> so uh, he's alive and kicking. But he did this analysis. Of, he's, he was a Hungarian economist writing back in the old centrally planned days. And his interest is why, uh, clearly, why are Soviet systems innovating less rapidly than capitalist systems and why they're growing more slowly? And he wrote this beautiful analysis, what he called demand-constrained versus resource-constrained economies, and said, despite the theory, the reality is that capitalist systems are demand-constrained, and Soviet ones are resource-constrained. And he said, the reasons that capitalist ones are demand-constrained is that you, you, have, you want to pay as little as you can to your workers. Okay? You are trying to take market share away from other competitors, Therefore, you have excess capacity and you pay low wages. Effective demand is going to be low and you've got plenty of spare capacity you can bring in case one of your competitors builds a phone that blows up aeroplanes. 
Imagine if Apple didn't have the spare capacity to expand into the market space the Samsung 7 has created for Apple. Okay? So you've got to have that spare capacity for competitive reasons as well as because you're in a growing economy. You take that for granted. When you build your first factory, it's probably going to be operating at 50% or less capacity with the intention to expand over time. So all these reasons mean you're demand constrained, not resource constrained. Resource constrained economies are set aside here. You want to pay high wages to your workers. Okay. Every investment project is worthwhile because you're trying to industrialise. Consequently, everybody gets less investment funds than they need. So your rationing system ends up being by queuing. And the best way to make sure you can produce the maximum volume is produce last year's product again this year. And my favourite instance of that, this is a personal story, but my, my, one of my early girlfriends uh, had a brother who couldn't afford to buy a, a, a large... He wanted to buy a 650cc motorbike, but he couldn't afford the $3,000 it would cost to buy a Suzuki or a Yamaha or a Honda. But he found he could buy a Cossack for $650. So it was a dollar per cc. And I was at the house the day that the, the bike arrived. It arrived in a wooden crate. We had to peel the wood off. And then there it was sitting on another, like a, a wooden pallet, with straps, go, canvas straps going over the top of it, with oil-soaked rags. And we, we pulled the canvas off and we got the oil-soaked rags off and there sitting on the podium was a 1942 BMW, the thing that Steve McQueen escaped in one of those classic American movies. It actually had a bicycle seat rather than the, the sort of thing that a, that a, um, a you know, modern bike has. And so the, the Russian Cossack motorbike, which could, it could tell a barn, you know, had enormous torque, uh, was, they hadn't changed its design in 30 years. This is 1973, I think. And there was a 1942 BMW. So that's a resource-constrained economy. So we don't live in one of those. But that's fundamentally neoclassical economics models a resource-constrained world. So even in that sense, we've got, we're modelling socialism and calling it capitalism. So there's all sorts of errors in all this stuff. So you, but even, even if it was all correct, you still can't do micro-foundations because what that involves is extrapolating. If you think about what the model does, it takes, gives you a model of an isolated consumer and an isolated firm and then aggregates them to the market level. Okay? Extrapolates. It doesn't actually add them up. It extrapolates. And... It can't be done, which the sonnenschein mandel de theorem itself shows, but real sciences don't do it either. Now, what is going on is that we've persuaded ourselves we're doing reductionism. We've taken reductionism to the nth degree. But what we're actually doing is constructionism. We take, uh, we're trying to construct the aggregate by extrapolating from the individual up. And that's what the new classicals thought they were doing when they did micro-foundations. And here's Lucas back when he began the whole critique of what he called Keynesian economics. The structure of econometric models consists of the optimal decision rules of economic agents. So you model the decision-making rules and you extrapolate that to the macro level. And this whole fixation with deriving macro from micro came from this idea that we had to make it consistent. We had to get results in macro that are identical to what we get in microeconomics. That's what Anderson called construction, of which I mentioned, mentioned earlier trying to extrapolate from a single component to get the macro level. And I, I just love sending this stuff up, uh, but I'll, I'll go through the argument that, that, uh, that Anderson made very seriously. The ability to reduce everything to simple fundamental laws does not imply you can start from those laws and reconstruct the universe. And the main attack was scale and complexity make that impossible. The behaviour of large and complex aggregates is not understood by simple extrapolation. But that's what neoclassical micro to macro has done. And this is a beautiful expression of it. At the least level of complexity, entirely new properties appear, the understanding of which requires at least as fundamental thinking as the lower level. So you can't derive the micro from the macro. You put together this lovely little table saying that you can actually say that the elementary entities of one science obey the laws of science Y. So uh, chemistry obeys... Uh, many uh, body physics and so molecular biology based chemistry, cell biology based molecular biology, psychology 
has to be consistent with physiology and social sciences derived from psychology. But he says that hierarchy does not mean science X is just applied Y. At each stage you need to have new laws, new concepts. And he finishes up by saying psychology is not applied biology, nor is biology applied chemistry. And my punchline is macroeconomics is not applied micro. Just to give you my my, my favourite way of sending this up, if it were true that that's how you did science, then a biology question in an exam would be, please take these chemicals and make life. Okay? It's absurd, but that's what we've been doing in economics, pretending we can make macro from micro by adding the components together. Now, again, let's send this up. How do we understand... We've all got it sitting in front of us, this stuff. You know? We've got masses and masses of molecules of H2O here. And they're all consist of water molecules that look like this. Now, is there an ice molecule? Okay. If I froze this with all these terms of molecules of ice, if I heated it, would they all be steam molecules? If I shook them up, would they turn into snowflake molecules? Okay. That's all nonsense. Okay. All these properties are emergent. They come out of the interaction of absolutely identical molecules of water. You cannot understand water without understanding the interaction of identical elements. Okay? So even the fact that water is a liquid okay, is an emergent property. It's not you can't derive it from the proper you can't derive the properties of water from the properties of an isolated molecule of H2O. But we're trying to do that with micro from macro. So I think the whole the fact that the macro theory failed to anticipate the crisis is because it was micro-founded. You can't generate the phenomena we're talking about. So these are the quotes I took from um, from um, Kochilakota and uh, Blanchard earlier in the in the presentations, going slightly out of sequence. But I want to go a bit more through the arguments that Rome has made, which I think is wonderful, because uh, as well as making the statements I, I quoted earlier, he also went on to say that looking at the argument that the shocks they're using, the shocks to preferences and technology, the stuff that I quoted from Ireland earlier, said in response to the observation that these are imaginary, the standard defence is to involve Milton Friedman's methodological assertion from unnamed authority. In other words, there's no basis. He just made the claim up to defend the theory that the more significant the theory, the more unrealistic the assumptions. And then he says, that's not enough these days. So if you've seen, if you say there's some error in the model of the model that doesn't fit reality, the reply is all models are false. So you dismiss any contradiction between your model and reality by that hand wave. And that's where he came up with the idea of calling it post-real. But he did this wonderful satire and sight here, saying as soon as we got used to the idea of fluctuations caused by imaginary shocks, um, we started adding more and more imaginary elements to the models. And he now says what we now have is a type of phlogiston that increases consumption good outputs from the given inputs, investment specific phlogiston that increases capital goods, a troll making random changes to wages, a gremlin making random changes to the price of output, ether increasing, increasing risk preference and caloric making people want less leisure. And it's a wonderful trashing of the theory. And it's the sort of stuff I used to write. As I said, if my name was on there, people would have dismissed it outright, but it's Paul Romer. So in that sense, the, the core people in economic theory are starting to abandon it. And you know, it's, it, to me, it's fantastic that it's happening. But they've got to give up this belief you've got to work from micro foundations. So I took you through that whole argument beforehand, so I won't try to repeat myself here. Um, I'll just quickly do some of the maths and show that it's actually quite simple. And part of the argument I'm making really is the we are going through a phase in economics like the astronomers went through 500 years ago when Copernicus made the argument that the Earth is not the centre of the universe. He changed the saying the sun's the centre. And what you got out of that was a simpler model, far simpler to derive than Ptolemy's model, less accurate. Okay? They've had one and a half millennia to fiddle with the tables to get the idea of, of epicycles and eccentric motion and so on, and equants, yada, 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 to fit the data. So if you did a comparison of Ptolemaic models to Copernicus model when, when it was first invented, 
you would have rejected Copernicus' model because it was less accurate. But the reason it won it, it was simpler. So just to show you, just, it, it's a bit tedious, but I'll do it quickly. You start with the employment rate and differentiate with respect to time. You've got a simple chain rule. You substitute labour productivity in there and there's your population rate of growth. Put in productivity growth as well and define uh, the rate of economic growth this way. You find I've got an expression, the one I showed you beforehand. It's a, you do it in a, a, you know, a, a page of, of calculus. And the same thing applies to the other one for wages share. Again, I won't take you through it. It's just tedious to show it's quite straightforward calculation. Same for the debt ratio. And you get those three truisms. And then you can go from that to the other stuff I've shown you. I'll, I'll jump over some of the slides here as well. So those, those are all the expressions just deriving each of those elements. And I want to just go through what's the intuition now because when I got that result, this is, I got that result when I did my Minsky paper back in 1992, published in 1995. And this phenomenon was a complete surprise to me. Okay. It wasn't in the, we hadn't seen the great moderation turning up in the data yet because I just said I wrote this thing in August of 1992. It's well before that obvious phenomenon of declining peaks in unemployment and inflation turned up in the data. So what's actually going on there? Well, looking at the model, one of the advantages of producing an incredibly simple stylized model like that is you don't have a whole lot of extraneous elements changing. So the interest rate is constant in this model. There's no Ponzi investing going on either. So what actually explains the dynamics? Well, the first start is you start with a high profit share and given the linear investment function, that means you get high expectations of future profit so you get high investment given that investment function. That causes a boom because you're now investing, increasing a, a, your productive capacity, and as you increase the number of factories, you've got to increase the number of workers you hire, so employment rises. Now, rising employment given the Phillips curve relationship gives you higher wages as well, and because you've been investing in excessive retained earnings, you've also got a rising debt ratio and you've got to pay additional interest on that. So the debt ratio rises and debt servicing rises during the boom as well. So when the boom is in full swing, you've got higher wage costs than it began with, higher interest costs than it began with, so profits are less than capitalists expected. The change in distribution of income means they have less profit when the boom peaks. And consequently, they've got, therefore, they have less investment, so the rate of growth of the economy slows down, you go from a boom to a slump, and then those euphoric expectations that gave you the boom give way to depressed expectations because you have a low rate of profit. And then the slump reverses those income distribution dynamics, but it takes a while for the reversal to happen. So as it's going on, aggregate demand's falling because employment's falling and wages are falling. Uh, debt, but you've still got debt servicing. You've taken on this debt, effectively in expectation that you could repay it, but you've got less cash flow than you thought you'd have, so you have a residue of unpaid debt. But then, as wages fall, you finally get back to the point where you restore the euphoric expectations that came out of the profit share capitalists were getting up in the first instance. So a new boom starts, but it starts with a higher level of debt relative to GDP. And that means higher inequality, because the larger share is going, there's less banks, a small number of bankers, large number of workers, higher income for bankers, lower income for workers, you've got more inequality coming out of it. And that happens at the next boom and the next boom and the next boom until you get to the point where there's such a level of debt taken on that you can't offset the impact of that uh, debt service by falling wages. The debt continues to compound and you have a total collapse. You fall into a Great Depression. So that's the logical... That that's one of the advantages of having such a stylized, simple model. You can actually expose what the logic is. And that's what Minsky described in the financial instability hypothesis. In this sense, what I think you can see, people like Minsky, to some extent Hayek, people have actually looked at the cycles, Keynes and Schumpeter and Fisher. They were intuitively seeing this fundamental complexity in the economic system and trying to find a way of verbalising it. So if you look at Minsky, 
he argued that the, the natural starting point for analysing, and this is the important point, that the relation between debt and income, so he's got a direct link between private debt and income, is to take an economy with a cyclical past that is now doing well. So you're in the recovery phase after a crisis. You've got an inherited debt level that reflects when there was a crisis. So you, your liability structures have a higher margin of safety than they were had before the, during the crisis. But, but as the economy recovers, two things become evident. First is you can pay debts back easily during the boom. And the second, that units were in debt, we therefore had levered positions, prospered, so it pays to lever. So you get rising expectations coming out of this as capitalists start to forget the preceding crisis. And that's uh, an incredibly important difference between Minsky's way of thinking about expectations and the mainstream because he sees expectations as being a response to current circumstances, not some rational calculation of the future. And he comes up with the argument that stable growth is inconsistent with how we finance investment in a debt financed capitalist system. And the fundamental, and this is when I remember reading this line, I thought this is the first time I've read a critic of capitalism who to me captures what I see as the, the true weakness of capitalism, which is one of its strengths. And that is the fundamental instability of a capitalist economy is upward. The tendency to transform doing well into a speculative investment boom is the basic instability in a capitalist economy. Now, if you look at Marxian critics of capitalism, um, or, pe or people like uh, even Hansen talking about secular stagnation, they all have this idea about capitalism and a tendency towards depression. What Minsky says, no, it's got a tendency towards euphoria. It's the accumulation of debt that causes the depression. Okay? It's a very different orientation. That's, I think, it's that one line is one of the reason that Minsky should get a posthumous Nobel Prize. Now, he rejected rational expectations, and this is a direct quote from 1972, that decision-making in the face of the intrinsically irrational fact of uncertainty. Okay? Neoclassicals try to ignore uncertainty, and again, this is one of Keynes' main critiques of it. And rational expectations itself is irrational on neoclassical grounds. We've been, all the way we've pulled the wool over our eyes is just ridiculous because when you look at Muth back in 1961, he was providing an alternative neoclassical explanation for the cobweb cycle. And one of his core propositions was, and this is a direct quote, information is scarce and the economic system generally does not waste it. Okay. Well, if information is scarce, doesn't it have a price? Okay. The neoclassical theory? And if it has a price, won't you buy it until the marginal benefit of the information is equal to the marginal cost of buying it? In which case, you'd have imperfect information, not complete information about the future. So it's nonsense. Even on neoclassical terms, it's presuming information is, is, inf is, is, is costless and infinite. It's just nonsense. It was a way of neutralising arguments about the cyclicality of capitalism. It wasn't a realistic picture at all. So the fact we even fell for it is just nonsense. And Keynes, again, put this, put this stuff beautifully, saying that we, we can't form our expectations by attaching great weight to matters which are very uncertain, such as what the future is going to be. So it's reasonable, therefore, to be guided by what we know at the moment, accepting that our knowledge of the future is vague and scanty. So for this reason... Facts of the existing situation enter disproportionately into the formation of long-term expectations. We take, it, we take the current situations now and we extrapolate them forward. And we don't take the entire system, we take the part of the system that matters to us. Workers, when they're considering whether they want wage rises or not, worry about the current rate of unemployment and the change of the rate of unemployment. Capitalists worry about the level of profit they're getting and change in that. Okay? We focus on the segment of the system that matters to us. We don't have an overall model, and we certainly don't have a neoclassical one. If we did, we'd be wrong anyway. Okay? So the whole idea that there's a correct model there, and we all use the same correct model, it's just, it's just nonsense. So Minsky got to where he was by rejecting the model of the neoclassicals, and yet the neoclassicals are now trying to model Minsky, which I find quite hilarious. You know, they, they simply can't do what they want to do 
to capture Minsky within a framework that, as Minsky said, simply ignores the fundamental causal factors in capitalism. So there's a whole range of readings that I'm, I've got a set of references at the end. Um, it's a very painful thing to tell people you should read that many books by Marx, but it does help. I've got a, my own interpretation, which is rejects the labour theory of value. Uh, Irving Fisher, that's a bit shorter. Schumpeter, Theory of Economic Development. And Keynes, especially the 1937 papers. They were the main influences on Minsky. You won't find a single reference to Marx in his written works, for one simple reason. He wrote during the McCarthyist period in America. If he had admitted he read Marx, he would have been kicked out of act, lost his job. You know, would have been selling hamburgers would have been the best job he could have got. Uh, I know that he read Marx for one simple reason. Um, when I was writing Debunking Economics back in 2000, I spent six months at the Levy Institute. And as it happens, his son Alan was there. And they knew I was my work on Minsky and we chatted away. And Alan at, at the time was working, I think he's still working in what they call the indie media, the sort of precursor to the internet media today. And Alan and his father, you know, the usual sort of thing, son and, sons and fathers often don't get on for a while. So he rejected economics, wasn't interested in it in his 20s. But in his 30s, he started to get curious and sort of reconciled with dad over it. And he told me, he went to see his dad one day and said, look, what book should I read first to get a handle on economics? He said, dad went into his study and came out with the book and gave it to me like this and said, this is the first one you should read. It was volume one of Das Kapital. So Minsky was read and was affected by Marx, but he didn't follow the labour theory of value. He won't find an essence of that there. But then, of course, he read Fisher, and he was trying to explain the, the financial, the Great Depression, and saw Fisher as the best reference for that. There was no reference to Keynes in Minsky's writings until the early 1960s. He had Schumpeter as a PhD supervisor, and with Keynes, he only began to realise what Keynes was on about when he read the theory of employment that Keynes' own summary of the general theory, which is written in actually before Hicks's so-called summary. And he read that and said, how can anybody regard the ISLM model as a summary of Keynes? So after reading 1937 papers, that's why he started calling himself Keynesian. And that's why he called his first book John Maynard Keynes. So again, if you want to read Minsky, uh, I prefer to say don't read Stabilising an Unstable Economy, but I'll say read that last. Okay? Read John Maynard Keynes first if you want to have a serious study of that, because that's the, the best book-length treatment of his thesis that he ever put together. Definitely get Can It Happen Again, a book of readings. That he writes beautifully in a short run. Okay? They're great, great papers, very readable. Stabilising an Unstable Economy, you talk 15 years to write and he really didn't have much extra to add to what he wrote in John Maynard Keynes so it's a, a stumbling book and I remember when Krugman was writing about reading Minsky for the first time he said how re the experience of reading Minsky was less interesting than the thought of reading Minsky and I wrote when his blog saying put that book aside and get a copy of Can It Happen Again because he didn't read what I had to say so a lot of Neoclassicals, when they a they misinterpret Minsky or Keynes when they read them anyway, but b they're trying to, they're reading the wrong book because then you go oh, stabilizing an unstable economy. His last book that must be the best. No, it's not. Okay. So read John Maynard Keynes if you want to read a book. Read Can It Happen Again to get a really nice, concise, powerful statement of his hypothesis. And if you really have to read stabilizing an unstable economy, but you'll feel about it like. Brugman justifiably did. So, and the key question he was asking, and this is the ultimate question: Can it happen again? And if it did, can it happen? Why didn't it happen before 1982? Those are the key questions. And he realised you had to have a model that gave you a Great Depression as one of the possible states of the economy. Now, what I've shown you is that actually emerges from a very simple model derived simply from economic identities. So that's, if I hadn't found that result, I wouldn't be making the strong case I am making, that we should be working from macro definitions down. And I think, actually, that might be a good point to take a break. Am I close to a good time to stop? Half past 12? Any, any questions? And we'll um, come back later. <laughs>
Now we can have a very uh, 